This is session two, part two. And we are looking at the way of wisdom. I want to read this passage to you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through me, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. Now, I think it's easy to read a passage like that and just kind of glide through it and not really think about your health and wellness. But he's talking about it there. Respect of the Lord. And he says, for through me, your days will be many and yours will be added to your life. And then if you're wise, well, with his wisdom, that wisdom will reward you. And so we're going to take some of those wisdom guidelines that have to do with timing and record keeping, ice water, useful feel full strategies. We've already talked about movement and a little bit about portion control and then one healthy principle. And so when we think about timing, isn't timing everything? I'm waiting for energy and well-being to come. You're waiting for it to come? Is that how it's going to happen? That kind of sounds like a, a proverb that goes like this. A slugger does not plow in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. Well, that's how it is going to be with energy and well-being. Are you just waiting for it to come? No, it has to, you have to be involved in it, and it involves timing. Especially when you look at that proverb there. He had to plant and plow and plant in order to get a harvest, and he didn't do it. And so when we think about timing, let's, let's talk about our, when we eat timing first. And you've probably seen sumo wrestlers. I've never seen one in person, a sumo wrestler. But uh, that's what they look like robed. Sometimes they get out on the mat and they're wearing their diapers, you know. And they're trying to push each other off that mat. And it's the weight is very valuable for them in order to push someone off the mat. And so what are their secrets to gaining weight? You know what they do? They get up in the morning. They skip breakfast. They go out and do their exercise. Then they come back and have a big meal. And then they have a four-hour nap in the afternoon. And then they diddle-dally around and eat late together late in the evening. Then they go back to bed and sleep. What do you think is happening to them during all that time? Yeah, they're gaining weight. That is their method. And you know, it seems to me like there might be a lot of Americans that are training to be sumo wrestlers. What, what do you think? There might be, because <laughs> there's a lot of people skipping breakfast, isn't there? And there they are, they're going out, and they're skipping breakfast, and, and the body is not on full mode. It's kind of hibernating in a sense, and you, gotta, you don't have that metabolic rate up, and then here you go out exercising, hey, the, the famine's coming, so we're going to hold back, the body is. And they're doing that as a strategy to gain more weight. And it helps to not be eating late in the evening. Do you know what percentage of daily calories are eaten by the French by 2 p.m.? The total number of calories that they're going to eat for the day is eaten by 2 p.m. What percentage? Boy, that would probably be very good if, if it was. It's not quite that high. 57 from the study I read. But when you think about Americans, what do you think it is for them? 20. 20, 20 that's, that's too low. 30, 40. That's too high. 35. 38 is what it is. 38. We've got 72% of what we're going to eat coming after 2 o'clock. And it can be late in the evening, can't it? And there was a study done at the University of Minnesota they were trying to determine what would happen if people would eat earlier in the day compared to those who, who didn't. Well, they discovered that those who would eat earlier in the day lost 2.3 pounds per week, while those who ate later in the day in the evening gained weight. And so that says something to us about timing. 
there about when we're going to eat. And whenever you think about eating, it's good for a lot of people, not everyone, but some people to slow down the fork. Have you ever seen the throttle on that, that fork, how fast it can move sometimes with some people? I mean, it's over, isn't it? They sit down to eat and it's over. It's a done deal. And so you haven't given yourself enough time to allow the feel full signal to kick in, which takes about how many minutes? Has anyone heard about that? It's, it's actually about 20 and so a good strategy if you're going to sit down and eat with a group of people is that you look at them and you pace yourself according to the slowest eater. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> but if you did, you would, be, you would accomplish that feel full feeling of satiety there, you know. You give yourself a chance at that. So again, that's about timing. There's a number of things that we need to time, meal timing, physical activity timing, sleep timing, when you take your medication. I'm taking insulin and I try to take it, there's a rapid acting, take it about 20 minutes before I actually eat. Checking your blood glucose two hours after you start a meal, and that's based upon the continuous glucose monitoring system with a pump. They found the, the highest level of blood glucose elevation after a meal is about 75 minutes when they finished eating. So when you start, you give yourself about two hours for most people, and that would be about right. When you take your first bite, time yourself, then check yourself two hours from that. I used to meet a guy with type 1 diabetes, a young man, at Brahms. That's where we'd meet. And uh, he, was he was, had type 1 diabetes, and he was taking one kind of insulin, and it was a short-acting insulin. I can't remember if it was Humalog or regular, but it would last for four to five and a half hours. That's all he would take. He would take it before a couple of times during the day, and he couldn't figure out why he was waking up every single morning with a high blood sugar. I told him, you need to take another kind of insulin, a basal or background insulin. And it was all a matter of timing. And he started doing that, and it worked wonders for him. And so when we look at this, this timing, record keeping is another idea. I briefly mentioned this last week. Keep good records of your blood sugars, food, and movement levels. And someone says, you've got to be kidding. I've never done anything like that before in my life. Well, here's what the wisdom principle says. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. We don't have any flocks or herds. But it would be a good idea to know the condition of our body. And you can do that by checking your blood sugar, by also keeping records. Those who lose the most weight are the ones who keep good records. And so keep a food diary and include the snacks. Snacks, should we even be eating snacks? Now here's an example that I was reading. Remember I mentioned the four by three strategy? You have four snacks a day with three light meals. And that helped cut back on a stress hormone that comes up to people and uh, helps them control stress by spreading out the meals during the day instead of just a couple of giant ones or three giant ones. And I saw this at Google, this picture, and I, I put in that idea about several meals, and this was the picture that came up. Do you think there could be uh, better foods that could be eating, that a person could eat than those? Well, there could. Because some of those foods actually drive up the blood sugar there. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, in just a minute, I'm going to talk about the glycemic index, but that is a high glycemic index. Watermelon, it will spike up the blood sugar. Is there anything else on there that you would, you would maybe remove and substitute with something else? Yeah, it, 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 I don't have that down, but it would really depend... I've heard if you don't cook the pasta that long, then it won't have the spike up effect as much as it would if you really cooked it for a long time. Uh, I guess they, call, what do they call that, uh, al dente or something like that? But anyway, there's something else there. The whole wheat bread is actually at 77. Better to have some sort of sourdough bread 
that has lactic acid in it. It tends to, to keep from having the spikes like, like that would. Uh, anything else? What about in the middle of the picture? The strawberries are good. What's that on top of? Yeah, that's an 82. These are very high. They spike up the blood sugars there. So anyway, watch what you eat with the snacks. What about ice water? You know, with water deprivation comes increased appetite and stress. I, I've heard it, I've read this, that, you know, especially in the summertime when you're exercising, you need to drink about an ounce for every minute you exercise. An ounce. There was a study done by the French researchers of 3,600 people for several years, and they tried to focus in on this variable, this, this one point, and they found out to keep the blood sugars in a more normal range, to keep from being pre-diabetic, if they would drink 32 ounces of water a day, it could make a difference. You know how many ounces are in that bottle? Yeah. So two of those a day. Try that. Try drinking two a day to stay hydrated. And then eat certain kinds of foods that we're going to look at here, like vegetables and fruits, too, that have a lot of water content to them. You want me to drink water? It's boring. We'll put a flavoring in it. You know, they, they don't add too many calories. And remember, these bring health to the whole body, these teachings. Proverbs 4, verse 22. And here is an example, like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. You know, we can get good news instantaneous now from a distant land, can't we? But in ancient times, it took forever to get good news from a distant land. And so here is the picture, like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. And that's the picture, that's the comparison. And guess what? Cold water is good for you. Isn't that neat? Hunger may actually be the need for more fluids. Sometimes you feel real hungry, well, drink a glass of water. Wait 10 minutes, see how you feel then. And maximum calorie burn by keeping water ice cold requires energy to warm it to core body temperature. Drink it cold if you can. That makes a difference. And so now we're going to look at these useful satiety strategies. Wisdom or Proverbs are like a beam of light going through a prism, breaking into all the colors of the rainbow. Proverbs are pictures of life, pictures of reality. The, the word basically means to compare, to be like, to represent. And so really there are so many descriptions that are given that a picture is given for you. And I want to give you an example of one here. Someone says, you know, a donut hole is a comforting food and you can't eat just one. Or I love my mashed potatoes and, or, or rice, you know. But looking at that, the donut hole, it is a kind of a comforting food. They, they do taste good, don't they? Has anyone ever tried one? Yeah. <laughs> but here's a proverb now. Now I want you to notice this. From the fruit of their mouths, people's stomachs are filled. With a harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. Now, of course, you look at that proverb, you'll see that fruit is synonymous with harvest down below. And basically, the, the meaning of this, kind of a dynamic equivalent to this, would be you will have to live with the consequences of everything you say. But you will also have to live with the consequences of everything you eat also. But the idea here is there's a picture being used. It's fruit. And guess what? Fruit is good for you. Now, we were talking about donut holes. I want you to see the donut hole there. It's, it weighs uh, half an ounce. And it's 52 calories. And the saturated fat's almost one. And the carbs are about 5.8. little, about like that. And so that's 52 calories. Now, let's compare that with strawberries. 5.1 ounces of strawberries equals 46 calories. What was the donut hole? 52. Here we have, and a little tiny half 
ounce donut hole is 52 calories. And 5.1 ounces of strawberries is 46 calories. It's 11 carbohydrates, but you have quite a bit of fiber in there too. And the fiber just kind of goes through the system, doesn't affect the blood sugars. And these, this kind of uh, uh, fruit is very beneficial, the kind of sugar that's there. And it doesn't drive up the blood sugars. And you can go to Calorie King dot com and you can look at you can put in any food there and you'll find out about the 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 density the calorie density rating system of any food that you have there and the more stars the better it is it's the idea of very low in calories per gram but you end up getting more volume that way well how to be full on fewer calories well, it's not go to IHOP when they're having their special and eat all the pancakes you can. That's not the way to do it. But here is a way to do it. What would happen if you ate a salad before each meal? What would happen? Would it affect the amount of calories that you would eat for the entire meal? Well, there was actually some research done at Penn State University. 42 women participated in a study. And what they did, they all did different things. That is, what they did is that they had the condition, the control condition was just to eat the pasta without eating the salad. And the others were, they were going to eat two different sizes of, uh, and then they were going to measure it at the end and how much they actually ate. Just go in, eat the pasta, and we'll measure how much you ate, okay? And then the other two conditions were two different sizes of pasta of uh, salads and it was based upon their weight and so if people would would take the 300 gram and if they would put a light like vinegar or something or vinaigrette on it and it was by weight okay 300 grams that would make a difference it dropped the total calorie content for the meal by 12 percent and a smaller salad you could see the results of that and I you know, the deal is use the low-calorie dressings like a vinaigrette dressing and have more salad. Remember, it was by weight. So if you put that rich ranch dressing on it or Thousand Island or blue cheese and all that, that's weighty. And you get less, they got less salad, and they ended up eating more as a result. Now, I've had a luncheon with some guys before, and they get this chef salad, and I guess they think they're eating healthy. And what I see is that they've got all this thousand on a dressing on it or ranch dressing just drenched with it. And I remember sitting there eating with them once and I got my salad and I had nothing on it. And I said, bring me some vinegar. And they brought this little device that carried vinegar and oil. And one of the guys sit, sitting there said, what's that? Didn't even know what it was, but it was vinegar. And I was just going to pour a little bit of vinegar on there. It doesn't weigh anything. It doesn't affect, in fact, it helps with blood sugar control. Some acid in vinegar helps with that. And so that can make a difference. Think volume. How can I put more volume in my meals instead of calories? The Mayo Clinic says choosing foods that are less concentrated with calories, like donut holes, meaning you get a larger portion size with a fewer number of calories, can help you lose weight and control your hunger. What are the benefits of fiber? Fiber limits a rapid blood glucose peak. It gives a full filling longer, and soluble fiber helps with cholesterol control. We're supposed to eat actually 30 grams as men and 20 for women each day. You know what most people eat? Yeah, less than 10. Now, you can look at this. You can make a comparison. Here's macaroni and cheese, and then here's veggie stuffed macaroni and cheese. Both the same number of calories. Which one do you think is going to fill you up more? Yeah. Jared's favorite. He's got his pair of pants, Mike was telling me, that he, that he keeps locked up. Jared lost a lot of weight, too. I think he was at 400 some odd pounds also. But for Subway. Here's one of his favorites. And it's just the idea of uh, good turkey bread. You, when we get a, something at Subway, load on the lattice. Just load it on. Ask for more. 
Get those veggies on there. It makes a difference. What does 200 calories look like? Well, here's broccoli. Here's peanut butter. That's the difference. Now, I know all of you love broccoli, don't you? You can't wait to get in there and have a plate of that. But you could have some sort of light, maybe ranch or something, and dip a little bit of that and really get a lot of good out of it to fill you up when you have that hunger pang. Look at this, apples compared to salted mixed nuts. We're talking, thinking about volume here, you know. Kiwi fruit compared to M&M candy. Look at that, fiber one cereal compared to Fruit Loops. And do you think you're going to get any fiber in that fiber one cereal? Yeah, lots of fiber. And here's some low-fat yogurt compared to Kisses, Hershey's Kisses. How many are there? Seven? Eight? Eight of those little guys there. So anyway, think volume, okay? That means vegetables, fruits. And then we, we talked about movement, but just one slide on that. If you were told about a once-a-day pill that could help you sleep better, restore your energy, improve your mood, reduce your risk of heart disease, help you to lose weight, and improve your blood sugar control, you would probably take it in an instant. And what is it? Movement or exercise. That's what it is. And so now I want to talk a little bit about portion control. And then one other one. Here is what one person said, my doctor has advised me to give up those intimate little dinners for four unless there are three other people with me. <laughs> That's what Orson Welles said. <laughs> now here's God's wisdom. God's wisdom says this. If you find honey, eat just enough. You know what the rest of that passage says? If you don't, you'll vomit. That's what the rest of it is. But that sounds, if you find honey, eat just enough. That sounds like portion control to me. Eat just enough. There was a study done in Chicago. And what they did, was they had a movie at 1.05 in the afternoon. And they were going to have people come in to watch this, this big blockbuster movie or something. And they were going to give them free popcorn and one soft drink. But they were going to give them two different sizes of popcorn with the requirement that they come back and answer some questions after the movie and also bring back what remained that they had. And so one of the questions had to do, do you think you ate more because you had the large size? Well, everyone said, no, we didn't eat any more. You know what the end result was? They did eat more because there was more in front of them. In fact, those with the big buckets, they ate 53% more than those with the smaller buckets. And that was 173 calories more. Now, what's the point here? Well, you may have seen this before, you know, that little dot, the size contrast illusion, which center middle dot is bigger? Yeah, they're the same size. But what if you, instead of using your big dinner plate, you use that middle size plate and you put the same amount of food on each one, would you get the idea that maybe you're eating more food? Maybe. I mean, I say try every little thing that you can to help you with portion control. If that helps you just using the smaller plate, why not try it? It's not going to hurt you. But you could, and I'm sure you've got the smaller plate. You could use it and try it. There's simple math. If you wanted to lose weight, here's a, here's a way to do this. Take your weight, let's say you're 230 pounds, you multiply that by 11, that gives you a 2,500 calorie uh, amount per day. And that's the idea that if you just ate that amount per day, you would not gain any more weight. And you just maintain doing what you're doing. But if you wanted to lose a pound a week, you would subtract 500 from that amount. That means 2,500 minus 500, you're down to a 2,000 calorie per day. And you could lose a pound a week. 
Hey, that's all right, isn't it? A pound a week. And so how many grams of carbohydrates should there be for a 200 calorie ceiling? 2,000 calorie ceiling. Well, about 40% is the idea. And so that means about 200 grams is what you would take per day. And you take variety of food and eat that. And by the way, I'll probably take the skin off the chicken there. And I might replace the bread with a sourdough bread there. And I don't know what that is. Is that, what kind of greens is that? So anyway, certain kind of carbs, I said 200 grams of carbohydrate spread throughout the day, remember. There's certain kind of carbs that you eat them and they will drive up the blood sugar just like a downpour. It's just downpour and it's driving up the blood sugar. There's others, it's just kind of a little sprinkle effect that don't really affect you, that don't affect the blood sugars. Those are the kind of carbs you want to concentrate on and, and eat. Now, if we were going to compare the two of which one would drive up the blood sugars more, would it be a baked potato or a sweet potato? that would drive up the blood sugars more. Baked potato. Baked potato. Now numbers have been given to these. To see the rate of metabolism on, these, on this kind of food. And they, they gauge it by two hours, okay? And some of these foods, they're through the system and within two hours, they spike up the blood sugar. Others are kind of the sprinkle effect, you know, and it doesn't affect you near as much. And so the baked potato is an 85, the sweet potato a 44, okay? And by the way, in the book, in my book, I've got four and a half pages of the kinds of foods you should eat with the glycemic index in there. They will give you an idea of, I need to be eating these kind of carbohydrates there. A peach versus cornflakes. Which one will drive up the blood sugar more? Okay. 77 compared to 42. All brand versus Rice Krispies. Okay, remember rice, okay? And 82 compared to a 30. You get a lot of fiber there. What about rolled, old-fashioned rolled oats compared to Special K? You think Special K will drive up the blood sugar more than old-fashioned rolled oats? Now remember, we don't want to eat, we're not talking about the, the kind of in the package that you put in the microwave and you cook for a minute. You get those different flavors, you know, and we're talking about the kind that takes you five, six minutes to cook or get the steel cut taking 20 minutes. Hey, guess what? 42 compared to 69. Eat old-fashioned rolled oats. You'll get some fiber and some soluble fiber in them also. And beans, another wonderful. Pinto beans, you can see the examples there. Canned is 45. Fresh is 39. And navy beans, canned is 38. I don't have the fresh there. But those are the examples that you have. And there's a lot of fiber in a serving of those. So those are some good ideas there to use. And then one more that I want to share with you. This is the last one. Sitting in the restaurant looking at the menu, I wonder, what am I going to eat? Have you ever done that? Of course you have. You go to the restaurant, you look at the menu, what am I going to eat? Now, one thing you could do is if you know where you're going, you know, they've got a website, you can look at the menu, you can determine ahead of time exactly what you're going to eat before you even go in there. And you'll know the, the calorie count, the breakdown, the carbohydrates, all of that before you even go in. You can check it out. Well, that relates to diligence. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. According to God's wisdom, what is diligence? Now, a lot of times what we think diligence is, and this is included in it, but it's the idea of like hard-working, industrious, tireless, unrelenting, persistent, that kind of idea. Well, it can be contained in that, but that's not the main meaning of the word diligence. The slugger craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. When you look at the background on that word, it's the idea of sharp, cut, quick, and decisive or determined. So it's the idea 
and you can look at different passages about this in the Bible, about the idea when something is cut, it can't be uncut. So it's the idea that if you know you're in a certain situation, you've thought about that situation ahead of time, and you've already made the decision ahead of time about what you're going to do. It's planning ahead. That's the idea of diligence. And then when you come to that point, yes, you can, you can quickly make a decision. You can quickly do something that can be hard working, whatever it might be, industrious. All of that is contained in there. But the decision has been made that the desires of the diligent or the determined or decisive are fully satisfied. They know what they're going to do already before they get in that situation. Now, I told you about Dr. Frederick Allen last week. He was the one that came up with that undernutrition therapy or the starvation therapy to try to keep people alive before insulin was discovered. He was telling his patients, eat less, be hungrier. That's basically what he was telling him. One of the patients was a person who actually, well, not directly his patient, but he followed that prescription of Dr. Allen. His doctor was Dr. John Williams. He was the first doctor in the United States to give insulin to an American. The first physician to do that. And what happened was that he had a patient named James Havens. It was in 1914, about Thanksgiving time. He was almost 15. He was diagnosed with diabetes at that time. He weighed 97 pounds at that time. He lived for almost eight years on Dr. Allen's undernutrition therapy. Almost eight years. And for periods of time, he was on a diet of 200 calories a day. You know what 200 calories looks like? That's it. You can see the turkey over there on the left, on the, yeah, left hand side there, 200 calories. Most of the time he's on 800 calories a day. What they would do, the reason that they, they did that, they tried to find out how much they could eat without the, the sugar spilling over, reaching the renal, renal threshold and spilling over into the urine. And they could determine how many calories they could eat by doing that, but as a result, to keep the blood sugars from getting too high and spilling over, and then what you do is go into a coma and die. He was able to keep his under control for eight years. Of course, he wasn't. It was his mother and others that helped to be able to do that. By the spring of 1922, he weighed 12, 73 and a half pounds. He was too weak to sit up in bed. He cried most of the time. His father was the head of the legal department at Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York. And he had combed the United States just asking and asking if there's anyone working on some sort of cure for this diabetes for his son. One day he had a person from Toronto who was there, who was the head of the, the store, of uh, the Kodak store there in Toronto. And he was just asking him, do you know of anyone that's, that's doing research on this? And he said, well, no, I don't, but I'll look, I'll ask. And so there he was golfing the next week, and he was golfing with someone, and he asked the question, and this guy knew exactly someone who had been doing research and had made a fantastic discovery. His name was Dr. Frederick Banty, and a graduate student named Charles Best. And when he, found, he brought that news back to James Haven's father, and he said, get, and he told Dr. Williams, go get some of that substance which we call insulin. And so he went, he was able to retrieve some, bring it back, and give James some injections, but they didn't work. And maybe it wasn't enough, or it wasn't uh, refined enough, or something, it just wasn't working. So a week later, that man, that manager of Kodak there, was back down to Rochester, and he asked him, he asked him if... Uh, how, how, how's James doing? And he said, uh, there's no hope. It didn't work. You see, before this time, James was just ready to roll over and die. I mean, he was just in excruciating pain. And he said, it just doesn't work. And he said, well, those guys have been, have been saving people's lives. That's what he said. What? 
Yes, they've been saving people's lives. And then Mr. Haven said, you go and get one of those young men and bring them here. And so he went back up there, Dr. Dr. Williams went back up there and talked to Dr. Banting, and he refused to go. And then he said, you're just like the rest. Dr. Uh, Mr. Havens said, it's just talk. It doesn't really work. Well, that kind of got him kind of fired up inside. He decided, I'm going to go down there. And he went down there, and he gave the insulin the first time, and then two hours later, and a little bit later, and guess what? It started working. And about a week later, James writes to Dr. Banting, a week ago last Thursday marked an historical event as I then tasted my first egg and toast. Now remember, he hadn't had anything for eight years. Egg on toast is my idea of the only food necessary in heaven, is what he said. That's how it felt to him. What a blessing it was. But what does this have to do with diligence? Well, when we think about this, his mother and others, what did they have to do? They had to weigh, he had every morsel of food that he ate meticulously weighed by his mother for almost eight years in order to survive. That's called diligence. That's called planning ahead. Now, if James could do that and live that long on such a small amount of food and use that powerful principle of diligence, what do you think we can do? We can do it, can't we? It can make a difference. So managing this chronic disease, it'll work. So the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So be diligent. And how can you do that? How many steps are you going to take each day? How many calories will you eat each day? You determine ahead of time what you're going to do. Know what you will eat before eating out. Just think ahead what you're going to have. And do that. Implement the plan. Six reasons why you should lose weight. You look better, you feel better, prevents or delays or helps control type 2 diabetes. Blood glucose will improve. Overall health will improve. You'll live longer. And encourage others to do it while you're doing it. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. The seven sweetest phrases in the English language are these. I love you. Dinner is served. Sleep until noon. Keep the change. All is forgiven. And I like this one. You've lost weight, haven't you? I was at a family reunion a few years ago, and one of my relatives said, Hey, Kenny, it looks like you've gained some weight. Did I want to hear that? (laughs) No. That's about the last thing I want to hear, but I, I like to hear that. You've lost weight, haven't you? We all like to hear that. That sounds good. And then thank you. Be thankful. So we have the way of wisdom. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. He also says, if you're wise, your wisdom will reward you. And another one. Eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know also that wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there's a future hope for you, for you, and your hope will not be cut off. If you find this wisdom and use it, and we've got it right in front of us, don't we? We can use it. And he said, God said that if you're wise with his wisdom, that wisdom will reward you. I like that. And by the way, honey is a 55 on the glycemic index, which is considered the low. It doesn't drive up blood sugars. You might have thought it did, but it doesn't. It's at a 55. Remember Cato? He started learning Greek when he was over 80 years old. People were asking, what in the world are you starting such an arduous, difficult task at your age? And he said, it's the earliest age I have left. Well, this is the earliest age we all have left. It's right now, isn't it? 
So if you've learned something you can put into practice, do it. One more thing, I want to read this prayer from Paul to the church at Colossae again. And then we're going to close with that prayer and then have door prizes. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from your glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Let's pray that prayer together. Our God and Father, we really thank you for this time that we've been able to look at your wisdom and see applications in our life on how we can live better and be an encouragement to others as well. And Father, we pray that you will help each one of us to be stronger with all the strength that comes from your glorious power. And we pray that you will help us to be able to endure everything that we face with patience while we joyfully give thanks to you each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.